here you have a vast amount of stolen gold that really didn't do much good to anybody. It wrecked lives all across the board. If we don't get what we want, if the police turn up or the alarms go off, I'll put a match to you and I'll put a bullet through the back of your head. This wasn't Ocean's Eleven. This wasn't, you know, some bright, sparkly guys who were kind of redistributing wealth. These were vicious, dangerous robbers. People were being killed, people were being shot and injured, people's lives were being ruined. This was really serious armed robbery. It was a robbery of such gigantic proportions and uh, a robbery that had such serious repercussions years down the line that it will never be repeated. I'm of the opinion that it's still in existence. It is out there somewhere. Twenty years ago, on the 26th of November 1983, Britain's largest ever armed robberies were made to look like raids on the corner shop by the most spectacular heist of them all, the Brinks Mat job. It wasn't just the biggest, but by far the biggest. The gang that broke into the vault at the Brinks Mat warehouse near Heathrow Airport escaped with 26 million pounds worth of the purest gold bars enough to upset the international gold price by the end of the day, enough to keep Scotland Yard on the case for the next 20 years. For even though some of the robbers were caught, not all of them were, and the gold was never found. The Brinks Mat job was the quintessential 80s crime, when wealth was still shifted around the world in crates of bullion. It revolutionized money laundering, linked criminal networks all over the globe, and gave a murderous twist to gang warfare. It even helped kickstart the property boom in London's Docklands and introduced a new name into the nation's gallery of rogues in Kenny Noy. What happened to the gold and the vast profits of the crime was until recently largely guesswork. Not anymore. This is the full story of that robbery and the search for the missing gold. This is Richard Bourne, and welcome to another day's programmes on Radio... On Saturday the 26th of November 1983, the security guard Michael Scouse arrived for work at the Brinks Mat warehouse. I opened the door at 6.30 and you come, because the alarms are running. I went into the Unit 7, I took off the night alarms, replaced them with the day alarms, then I let the rest of the lads in, relocking the door. Switched off. That then switched off all the systems in here. Michael Scouse was responsible for the valuables inside the vault until they were placed on an 8.30 flight to Hong Kong. There were six security guards, though only two of them knew the combinations to open the vault and the three safes. These were Scouse, the key man, and Robin Risley, his crew leader. We would go upstairs to the tea room, make a cup of tea, and Michael would sort out the shipman for the next day. What time did you finish last night? About half five. Half five? Yeah, early night. Lazy bastard. Tell me. What the guards didn't know is that they were being watched by a team of five armed robbers. The man who had assembled the team was Michael McAvoy from Lambeth in South London. At 32, he was already a prolific armed robber and for six months had been planning a strike on the Brinks Mat warehouse. To get inside the vault, they had to get past 11 locks, neutralize five alarms, and force the security guards to give them the combinations. In the vaults, they knew there'd be gold, but they didn't know how much. Nor did Michael Scouse and the guards until they read the logbook that had been left for them in the morning. It's gonna be a biggie. I noticed the other security guards were there, apart from Tony Black. He was my radio man that day. Here you are, Tony Black, late as usual. Here you are, come and check it. I went downstairs and there's Tony Black. 
waiting outside. So I let Tony in, uh, relocking the door behind me. Been up all night with the runs, isn't he? Look at him, he's gone grey. Yeah. Tony came in the second half to me and went to put a, a paper bag down. I think it had his food or something. I'm standing here, I then heard a commotion. Go for you fucking date! Now! All happened in a split second, really. Peter Bentley got a um, pistol whip. Get no, you fuck! Oh, careful, mate! Take it easy! Stay, stay down! Take it easy! Stay down and shut up! I turned round to find this man running at me with a balaclava ski-type mask on with a semi-automatic pistol in his hand. Put your hands behind your back! Which one, Scouts? You Scouts? Well, they asked me who Scouts was, and I said I was. You, 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 you Scouts? He told me that um, I lived in a flat um, in Rice High Street above a television rental shop, and that they'd been watching me for about nine months. Breathing. Breathing. Using a knife, they'd cut the top of my trousers, my jeans I was wearing that day. You know that smell? Uh, yeah, petrol. Yeah. And put a can of petrol under the hood. He said, you know what that is? I said, petrol. These are uh, emergencies. And then they poured the petrol straight down me. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes. All over one's private parts. I was picked up and dragged into another room and by the time I reached the other room there was a knife in the top of my trousers that just ripped all the way down to the bottom and they were, before I could say anything they were down around my ankles and there was uh, a liquid being poured on me which is obviously petrol because you could smell it. If the alarms go off, the police turn up, we don't get what we want I'll put a match to you and put a bullet through the back of your head. And I believe every word of it. The guards were hooded and cuffed, and Scouse and Risley were taken downstairs to the vaults. McAvoy wanted to be through by 7.30, which now meant they had 45 minutes to complete the job. Right, tell him you. Go on! Huh? I had the key and one half of the combination, and Robin had the other half. They asked me on what my numbers were, and they tried that, and it didn't work. Oh, come on! 31, 91, 35, 55, 55. <laughs> And I think he thought Michael was trying to muck about, but he obviously wasn't. It wasn't coming across. It just wasn't happening. And so in the end, I had to do it. Come on! <laughs> they were now a single door away from the vault, but the trickiest part was yet to come. The main vault door is open, and inside there's three smaller safes with a magnetic shield over the where the key goes into. I've got the keys for the three safes, and Robin had got the combination. First thing you do, <laughs> take the magnetic plates off. Inside the safes was a million pounds in banknotes. What is it? The problem was I'd forgotten the numbers and I just couldn't get in there. What is it? I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't remember. Oh. It's gone. Oh. Fuck about it, son. Open these safes. We want to get in there. I can't remember it.
With the minutes slipping by, Risley was threatened by McAvoy with castration. Well, God, why do you live about without your prick? God, I just can't do it. And at some point, he cut my hand. Well, you won't do it. If you think he's bad now, you should see him during the week. Ow. And with that, I was sort of roughly pushed back down onto the metal box and a gun put in my ear again. Get up here. Get up. What's in the barrel? Uh, that shit is sweat. So they left it. In fact, Scouse knew the barrel was full of precious silver. And that one? That's palladium sponge. What? What's in these boxes then? I can get In front of the three safes, I noticed uh, a couple of pallets uh, gold bullion boxes on. This is why no one would ever forget the Brinks Mat robbery. Inside the grey boxes were bars of the most precious metal known to man pure, unadulterated gold. And there was three and a half tons to shift. It had taken less than 30 minutes for the armed gang to empty the Brinks Mat vault of all its treasure. McAvoy had had big paydays before, but nothing like this. He didn't know it, but he'd pulled off the greatest robbery in British history. In the getaway van was 6,800 bars of pure gold. It's the weight. Someone's going to have to get out. It ain't a balloon, Mickey. <laughs> A mechanic who was mending a Brinks Matt van had been calling the Heathrow warehouse for over half an hour. The first call, there was no answer, which was very unusual. Gaz, it's me. It's me. Robert, it's me. No, no, don't worry, get a phone. Get a phone. 20 minutes later, we called them again, and there was an answer on that occasion. And they said, Yeah, yeah, hello. Call the police, we've been fucking turned over. Yeah, yeah, call the police now. We've got six tonne of gold in the back here. It's like a new or two bars, son. <laughs> An elite Scotland Yard team was at the scene of the crime within 30 minutes. Detective Inspector Tony Brightwell was among the first to arrive. When we arrived at the scene, it was a warehouse type uh, situation. When you got up to the first floor where the control room was and where the guards' uh, restroom was, it was uh, in complete disarray. There were chairs turned over. There was a strong smell of petrol. It, it was a mess. A forensics team was deployed and an appeal made for witnesses. But there was little to go on beyond what the guards were able to remember in their first brief interviews. Three armed with revolvers and automatic pistols. Some wearing masks, all. Caffey! Between 30 and 40. Caff! What is it? Come here. Quickly, they rounded up the six security guards, handcuffed them, and then forced petrol over one man and threatened to set a light to it. Another guard was pistol whipped, and eventually all the guards ended up in hospital. The thieves then moved 6,800 oh bars of pure gold, each one weighing one or two kilos, about three tons in all. Oh, for good no! They are contained in 76 boxes. Not no more, they're not. <laughs> Those boxes will weigh each in the region of 100 weight. The only thing that became certain from the first news reports was that the stolen gold had been worth 26 million pounds. 
But even as this figure was reported, the bullion markets were reacting to the loss, and by the end of the day, McAvoy's treasure had appreciated in value by a cool million pounds. As for the main losers, Johnson Mathie Bank, its brokers now spent a frantic 24 hours relaying the bad news to customers in the Far East. Not everyone was reached, as Simon Churchill, the bank's bullion instructor, found out. I remember one customer calling, um, shipment was going to Singapore, and uh, he just said to me, Simon, um, our gold didn't arrive. Um, and I said, no, John, you're right, it didn't, and it's not going to. And there was a sort of a pause on the end of the phone, and I just suddenly heard this, Ah. Detectives were back at the scene today, but they admit they face a difficult task. The gang were clearly highly professional and organised. The gold was marked, but the chances are it's already been melted down. Or with Heathrow nearby, it could have been out of the country within hours. It's not much to go on. But the police did have one thing to go on, which they were keeping close to their chest. The first theory in a case of that magnitude is there must have been an inside agent involved, i.e. someone that worked at the warehouse must have been involved, either giving information to the robbers or actively assisting them to get into the building. Uh, so the initial uh, investigation uh, focused on precisely this. The guards that were on duty at the time, uh, other guards that worked at the premises, and we looked into their family history and we tried to, to prove a link to uh, someone that uh, would be capable of committing this, this type of robbery. So everybody's a suspect, so it was difficult to... You had to be nice to them, to the guards, but also you had to be wary that they weren't involved in the, in the robbery themselves. Bill Miller, now retired to the Orkneys, was on the Brinks Mat case from day one. A week after the robbery, he was part of the flying squad team which questioned the security guards again. Michael Scouse was top of their list. At the time, I was a member of a, a rifle and pistol club in London. So obviously, being the supervisor that day, I'm uh, the chief suspect. A few days after the robbery, we decided to do a reconstruction. Um, it was designed really to interview each guard uh, who was at the scene of, of the robbery on an individual basis without assistance from their, their colleagues. The technique had never been used before in Britain, but it was to provide the police with the breakthrough they needed and was used as evidence in court. It would lead ultimately to a string of convictions. I then came down here, pushed this door open, and then the door shut behind me. I identified Tony Black there, I opened up the door. I went first and um, the idea was I'd walk up to the front door, show them the front door key and they would video it. Then after a few moments I'd say stop, check the statement, then say carry on. As far as you are aware, were you the first person to be brought down by the robbers? During the raid, yes. Part of the uh, strategy here was that we intended to expose flaws in their version of, of the events. For about half an hour, I tried to set these, but I had forgotten the numbers. And during that half an hour, I was threatened, more or less, with everything, from being uh, changed sex to being stabbed or scarred or whatever. They could get an idea of where everybody was and why uh, certain people didn't see things and why certain people did and, and, and that was the obvious reasons why they wanted us to do that. So I just came here. Then Mick came in, had a few words, then he went out into there. Hey, hang on a Mick, so we've got Bentley making the tea, have we? Yeah. And the other three... Risley was sitting over there. Yes. Uh, it's about right now. OK. When we came to interview uh, Tony Black, it was obvious that the man wasn't right. There was something wrong with his, his story. Oh, they went downstairs to the toilet. Did you say that was your intention, Tony? Or did you just... No, I just went down to the toilet. You just went down to the toilet. Been up all night with the runs, didn't he? 
Look at him, he's gone grey. Uh -huh. Yeah. It became quite obvious that his uh, evidence was flawed. I can remember sort of seeing someone in the background. You know, it wasn't sort of clear, but he, he was in someone in the background. He claimed not to have seen things when it was quite obvious that he would and should have seen them. Where's Black? Oh! Get up, mate! Right, you! See that? Do the shutters! Get the shutters up! Is that it, you mug? From where you were standing, could you see the shutters open? No, I was... I was looking in the corner, like. When he was asked if he could tell us what vehicles were used to take the, the gold away, and he said, no, no, I, I wasn't in a position to see out of the, the window of the control room. Are you standing in exactly the same position as you were in? I think I may have even been closer, cos I was doing it like that, rather than... like that, so it must, must have been about here. He ended up with his nose up against the wall and just an impossible position. You know, was, he had to get right in the corner, otherwise he had to see what was going on downstairs. And it was obvious he was telling little porky pies at that stage. Five, seven, eight, one, seven, eight, six. That's the old Pofo number at Brinks Manor. Whilst he was going through the reconstruction, um, he had left his diary uh, on a table, uh, which uh, we, unbeknownst to him, took possession of and had it photocopied and returned to where it uh, was taken. 8932955. That's uh, my bank number at Twickenham. What is W-A? That's my wedding anniversary. Who is G. Harding? Check me. Uh, he used to work at uh, Brinks Matt. I'll do his car. This entry, Tony. Uh, day of the robbery. Why do you write 6.30? That's what time I start. You've never written it. You've never written it before. Why'd you write it down on this Saturday? On the day of the robbery? I don't know. No particular reason. You changed your diary, Tony. I showed him a copy of, of the diary and the photocopy that we'd earlier taken without him knowing. And this seemed to have a pretty dramatic effect on the situation. He was obviously taken aback by this. I took a look before we did the filming. Look, here, 1.30 on the day of the robbery. That's been added. Why'd you do that? I don't know. Do you drink a lot, Tony? Yeah, I like to, uh... Occasionally you have the light hour with the lads, and What does your brother-in-law, Tony Robinson, think of the robbery? Well, I haven't spoken to him, so I, I don't know what he thinks. Related through common law, his sister uh, lived with a man called Brian Robinson, uh, who we suspected of uh, being uh, concerned in armed robbery. Right. OK. We'll end there. It was then we decided to terminate the interview and uh, take him down to his cell. Black is not a professional criminal. He obviously wasn't used to being on the inside of a police station, or indeed locked up in a cell. There's a takeaway place which cooks them there while you wait. Oh. I got him at 9.45. And I went to bed at 10 first. Stop there and listen to me. Tony was quite an affable sort of chap. He was, you know, he was a bit, bit of a chatty lad, but never cut out to be a, an armed robber or a, a hardened criminal. You know, he was just a bit of a chatty lad and eventually succumbed to the temptation. Can I have a cup of tea?
Where do I start? Let's start from the beginning. Just over a week after the Brinks Matt robbery, the police had found their inside man. Where do I start? It's Robinson, isn't it? Brian Robinson, a veteran armed robber of 44, nicknamed the Colonel for his organizational skills. Robinson was living with Tony Black's sister and in 1982 started asking Black about his work at Brinks Matt. We asked him, you know, what planning went into the robbery, uh, how many times he'd met them, who had he met. Um, and he told us uh, of various meetings prior to the robbery where he'd met Mickey McAvoy and Brian Robinson. In the spring of 1983, Black said he was asked by Robinson to meet a friend of his called Mickey. Ah, hello, bruvs. I'm good, mate. Good. How's this? Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah well, she yeah. well? Yeah, you looking yeah. after me, sister? Of course. How you been? I'm all right, mate. I'm all right. Tone, this is Mick. Mick, this is Tony. Right, mate. You two want to talk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am well, I right in thinking that you'll bang out for this, then? No, I'm so At the meeting, Mickey had some questions for Black about Brink's mat. So I, I, I load the stuff, and, there, and there's this, the key man, and he's got the keys. So you don't ever have any combinations or nothing? No. You can lay your hands on some keys, though, for a while, is that right? Hang about, hang about, hang about. Oh, oh, oh. Leave it out. Come, on, come on. Oh, I've only missed it. Come on, man, leave it out. Sorry, I missed it. I missed me bite. Leave it alone. It. So, sorry, sorry. Can you or can you not get us some keys? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. All right. Do that, I'll right? yeah. like You take care, yeah. 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 One day, Robinson gave Black a camera and asked him to take some snaps of the Brinks Matt vault. He did this secretly during a tea break, and a week after that, he was taken to a house in Deptford where he met another friend of Robinson's, a man that Tony Black claimed later was called Tony White. White, recently released from prison, had a long record for burglary, armed robbery and assault. Black said he'd known White on and off for 10 years. At the Deptford house, Black saw his photographs had been blown up, and he was asked to explain as much as he knew about how the various combinations worked. They knew the whole layout. He told them exactly all about the guards, where they left. He gave them all the inside information. Whatever they wanted, he told them. There you go. Well, these are work, will they? Yeah, if they don't, is that? Right? Black was also persuaded to steal a set of keys for Unit 7, which he managed to do one dinner time. He handed them over to Mickey, and within the hour, Mickey had produced an identical set, which he now wanted Black to test. At first, Black had trouble working out which keys fitted what, and when he finally got one of the keys to turn, it would not come out. The plan, then, was to phone Robinson from work the next time he was given a Saturday morning shift. The shorthand was, we're going fishing. So I rang Brian from the payphone at the Brinks Mat as soon as I found out I was working on the Saturday, you know, to say that I, we're going fishing, you know, like, in the morning. And uh, he rang me at home later, said we've got to meet near the Bulldog, and uh, after work. At this meeting, Black was asked to run through who his fellow security guards would be on the morning shift. I asked you to tell me his name, not where he's from. Well, no, that is his name. Oh, Scouse. 
I don't want your dad's all over my car. And when asked what would be in the vaults, claimed that he didn't know, but that on previous Saturdays it had been as much as three million. What in cash? Or in diamonds? Or gold? You ain't making this up, are you, Tony? No. That's good. Come on. On the morning of the robbery, Black was five minutes late. This was not part of the plan. He had genuinely overslept. Been up all night for the runs, isn't it? Him, he's gone grey. Uh -huh. But part of the plan was that he would make his excuses and go to the toilet, which was situated on the ground floor. There, he would wave from an open window to give the men in the parked van the all clear. From this point on, Black's account told the police nothing new, except for two telling details. Firstly, he had been able to see out of the window, as Brightwell's reconstruction had shown. He also claimed to have seen McAvoy's face during the raid. He's lying in the room, you know, the radio room. And I, I felt someone like, kneel beside me. And he lifted my hood up, and it was Mick. It's all right, got the lot. That McAvoy had been seen by Black was, as the prosecution later noted, very convenient. Oh, they went downstairs to the toilet. After 48 hours of interrogation, Anthony Black was charged with conspiracy to rob the Brinks Mat warehouse. My late father went to his grave cursing Tony Black for what he did to me, did to my other colleagues and their, fa their families and friends. And as far as I'm concerned, Tony Black is the scum of the earth. Once Black had been charged, he was asked to confirm the identity of the people he'd named. That's Mickey. Michael McAvoy was known to the criminal intelligence branch, was known to the flying squad, and was strongly suspected of being deeply involved in armed robberies, emanating from this kind of triangle in South East London. Police and thieves in the street. At dawn on December the 6th, the police moved in. They arrested White, Robinson and McAvoy and took them to three separate police stations. Catching the suspects was one thing. Getting enough evidence to secure a conviction, however, was quite another. Do you know Tony Black? Do you know Brian Robinson? Were you aware of the approaches made to this guard by Brian Robinson? This job is so far beyond what you expected, isn't it? Mm. Do you know where the Bulldog Pub is? At that time, you interviewed them. Um, they didn't have to have a solicitor. In some cases, there were some solicitors that you would refuse to let in because you knew that if you let a solicitor in, he would be straight out and tell everybody else what was going on. We possess information suggesting that you were involved in the planning and commission of this robbery. I'm completely innocent of all these allegations put to me and I demand my solicitor present here during all these interviews. Across London, Tony White had been having his own interview. The police told McAvoy that White, when faced with Black's incriminating evidence, had wanted to make a deal with the police straight away to return the gold. White has intimated that he might be prepared to give some back. What's he going to get out of it? Well, what do you think? Don't know. I suppose he wants some sort of leg up, doesn't he? Whether Tony White had ever read Tony Black's statement in the first place, let alone agreed with it, was to be hotly disputed in the months to come. He's read it. The crucial statement, though logged by police as evidence, was subsequently lost and never produced in court. Much was to depend at the Old Bailey on the missing exhibit, RS1. Don't know why White's done that. If White has done that, then it's 
Buzz ought to help himself and all. So you were involved in the robbery then? After two days in custody, McAvoy, Robinson and White were charged and put on remand. And the gold, Tony? Whatever they got away with, no one could touch. Not for five years. I heard Mickey say it was going in the ground. Probably be concrete over. Beyond that, Tony Black knew nothing. Ten weeks after the robbery, the police were still no closer to finding any gold. Despite the arrest of three suspects and the inside man, no one at Scotland Yard was any clearer where the Brinks Mac gold was. After the initial arrest, there was an absolute commitment on, on the part of the Yard to get this money back. The thought was, we've got to get this money out of circulation. We cannot leave the money out there for the villains to reinvest. So I think there was a lot extra effort put into the recovery than, al than in almost any other case I'd ever been involved in. Police, Scotland Yard. Oh, um, I'd like to see the captain. Can't try. publication of a, of a fairly substantial reward produced piles and files and files and files of the most bizarre claims. Neighbours were complaining about their, their, their neighbours um, digging in the garden at the dead of night and they thought they were burying the gold. Yes. People were coming along with, with um, lodestones and pendulums and maps and saying they, they could point to where the gold was. Yes, madam, thank you, goodbye even down to one, one person claiming that extraterrestrials had, had, were telling him where the, where the gold was and that, you know, <laughs> we should listen to the extraterrestrials. If the gold was proving elusive to the police, at least they were having success in gathering evidence against the suspected robbers. The critical day arrived when Robin Risley was asked to ID the man who'd held him at knife point inside the vault. It's quite daunting because they can see you and you can see them. It's not how I believe an ID price should be. The lineup had to repeat the first words Risley had heard during the robbery. Get fucking down! Get fucking down. I walked up and down the, uh, I think it was 12 or 10 people that were standing there and I picked out who the people in the ID parade has been there on the day. On the first day of 1984, the abandoned getaway vehicle was found. The police realised its significance immediately. A few weeks before the robbery, after it had been stolen, it, it had been spotted um, uh, bearing false number plates in a street directly opposite Blue Cars, a minicab company owned by Brian Perry. Hi, Brian. Brian Perry was an old friend of McAvoy's. They'd known each other since the early 1970s, when McAvoy ran a greengrocer's shop next door to Perry's cab firm in Peckham. Both had links with the South London criminal yeah, underworld. Uh, uh, last week. He's still trying to learn decimalisation. <laughs> as soon as McAvoy was charged for the Brinks Mat robbery, Perry got busy organising his alibi and laying down plans to spring his friend from Brixton jail. No, there's no net there, pal. It's an open yard. Yeah, we've got to crack on with this, all right? The information uh, was received at Scotland Yard that there was uh, going to be a serious attempt to spring McAvoy from prison by using a helicopter. This uh, threat was taken very seriously. On one occasion, they actually did a dry run where the helicopter flew very close to Brixton Prison, but it was warned off by a police helicopter uh, because it was in airspace that it shouldn't have been in. However, we did move McAvoy to Winchester Prison. At Winchester, Michael McAvoy went on hunger strike to get himself back to London. And when that failed, Perry was left to dream up a new strategy. There didn't seem to be much evidence of this to Cathy Meacock, McAvoy's girlfriend. Kathy, you're a baby. Uh, what is that? Oh, it's a little joke, isn't it? 
What? At Mickey's expense? No, not at Mickey's expense. Look, it's all right for you, Brian. You're not in there, are you? It's all right, we'll get him out. With what? In fact, what Perry did next was to turn his attention to the key witness against McAvoy. This was Robin Risley, the guard that McAvoy had shown himself to during the raid. Ever since the robbery, he'd felt his phone had been bugged, but the police didn't want to know. You got to the stage that everything you did, you were looking over your shoulder, and I, I quite often did a lot of running, and uh, I would never run the same way twice on two occasions, just in case. If somebody did want to run you over, you weren't going to make it easy for them to know where you were going to go, because that would be the easiest way of getting rid of a witness and having an accident. The threat to Robin Risley was not taken seriously, and he was offered no protection by the police. By contrast, Tony Black was guarded at all times. There came a time when Tony Black had to formally identify McAvoy. Um, the parade, the identity parade, was, was held at uh, Ealing Police Station. The line-up was held and McAvoy was stood, I think, somewhere near the middle. Uh, Black came into the room, walked up the line when he came to McAvoy. McAvoy whacked him hard, uh, punched him, uh, and shouted out to him, you fucking slag. The trial at the Old Bailey began at the end of October, amid heavy security. Despite what looked like overwhelming evidence against them, there was never any question of how the three defendants would plead. Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Michael John McAvoy. Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. The basis of the defence for all three was that they had been fitted up by the police. A common defence used in those days was uh, the defence that uh, admissions they allegedly made had been put into their mouths by police officers. The common expression for that is uh, verbaling or verbals. There was much talk of verbaling in the Brinks Matt trial. White's QC, John Matthew, was determined to show that the police had put a confession of guilt into the mouth of his client. At one of White's interviews after he was arrested, he was alleged to have been shown Black's original statement. And having read it twice, he then, according to the police officers, had made admissions that basically this, this was correct. I said, you have read Black's statement twice now. Have you properly understood it? He said, yeah. If he had read the statement, which he completely denied, that those pages of the statement uh, would be covered in his fingerprints. At the conclusion of the last interview, I put an exhibit label on the document and gave it the reference RS-1. Now, the committal proceedings lasted for three days, and throughout the whole of that period, they were allegedly looking for this statement and unable to locate it which was highly suspicious. That document was never produced, was it? No, it was not. It has never been produced, has it? No, it has not. Don't just make any bones about this. You know, this is typical, bloody, serious crime squad verbally. Not only did Matthews argue that the police had verbaled White, he also encouraged his client to read out his own account of what had taken place in the police interview room. The officer said, look, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I know you will not tell us anything, nor will the other two. You've never nicked old Bill before, so I know you won't nick your own. We want that girl back and we don't care how we get it. It can be left on a motor or anywhere, or even on a rubbish tip or anything. We don't care if we don't nick anyone else. As long as we get it back, we don't care. I said, I've told you, I don't know nothing about it. He said, let me tell you. You three will be nicked for this and fitted up. We'll make sure you get a long sentence. That's why we're not making any notes at all. Because if we get any help from you, or the other two, we can write this up how we like. You know what we can do. You know the power we've got. Once White had finished, McAvoy tried to claim he'd been verbal too. But unlike White, McAvoy had been positively identified by Robin Risley. The plan now was to stop Risley taking the stand. 
he was given his evidence one day and the, the court rose at four o'clock for the day and he was to go back into the witness box the following morning. Now about seven o'clock the next morning I got a telephone call to go and see him urgently at home and uh, when I got there he was in a terrible state. My girlfriend received a letter and so did my mum. And one lives in Sheerness and the other one lives in Gravesend. So they're a long way apart. Uh, they said the same thing. If uh, Robin doesn't tell the truth, Oscar will leave him. And because my girlfriend and I knew exactly what that meant. Now, Oscar was a pet name for my uh, penis. So yeah, I, it was extremely scary stuff, you know. And, stuff you only see in movies, really. You don't expect to, uh, to be involved in stuff like that. They had to be in his house to know this. And uh, he was really, really unnerved by the whole thing and was on the verge of not giving any more evidence. I was really close to saying, well, sod you. you, you didn't look after me. I'm not going to give evidence. When I explained to him if we did that, we could possibly lose Robinson altogether. He was uh, quite adamant then he would go ahead. And a very brave decision he made. Risley took the decision to continue with his evidence. All right, yeah. Did the fella see sense? What are you talking about? Did you send him that letter? Wait, can you not do anything right? Perry's prolonged effort to intimidate the key witness had come to nothing. We've got to go around and see him again, mate. I'm a bit lively and all. What do you mean it's too late? It's the first time the Old Bailey's ever been in session on a Sunday. The judge, David Tudor Price, took this unprecedented step after the jury said last night they needed more time to consider. The jury felt that one of the defendants was not guilty. The question of verbaling remained unproven, but it was Tony White who walked free. McAvoy and Robinson both received 25 years. The police had got their main man, but they still hadn't found an ounce of the stolen gold. This was the stubborn fact that would soon breathe fresh and vicious life into the Brinks Matt story. For even as McAvoy was put behind bars, a new boss was emerging, and in his pay were villains of a new kind, like Kenny Noy. Scotland Yard's hunt for these men and the gold was to turn into a quest, even a crusade. McAvoy jailed was just the beginning of the story. And you can see the end of the story next Monday at 9. Later this week, a tragic tale of corruption and violence thousands of years ago. Murder in the temple is the theme of ancient Egyptians, Thursday at 9. Up next tonight, a thoroughly modern Graham.